Well, it's not like we haven't got a lot to discuss. Um, <laughs> oh, my word. I suppose I've got to start with you because of what's happened in France uh, over the last two weekends with the first round and then the second round. Did Macron's gamble of just suddenly saying we're going to have new elections for the National Assembly work, or has it been a disaster? No, it worked. It worked because uh, you needed uh, two, two things in, uh, in France party, in the French parliament. First, uh, to mobilize uh, the French uh, citizens because the threat of the extreme right was absolutely real. And from this perspective, I think that uh, the French citizens responded very well. Very high turnout, the highest since uh, the election of François Mitterrand in 1981. And uh, you might, I might sound naive or idealistic, but they won on values. They won because they understood that each generation must do its own battle to keep the values, the civil rights that we have, and to promote other civil rights. And the threat against uh, the fundamental Republican values with Le Pen was too high. I mean, look at the debate, uh, what they wanted to do with the binationals. Basically, if you are Franco something, you couldn't have access to some uh, post in the public service, which was clearly anti-Muslim, because they say binational, but it was against the franco Muslim. So the, the first point. And on this, the bet was won. The second, it is uh, uh, the National Assembly was blocked since 20, 19, uh, uh, 2022 because uh, there was a relative majority and because both, neither on the right nor on the left, they wanted to cooperate to provide solutions to the European system. Now we have to see whether in this new context there will be adults in the hemicycle or, a, or, or two rugby teams. So I, I was the BBC's Paris correspondent in 2002 when it Jospin failed to get into the second round of the presidential election, and suddenly it was Jean-Marie Le Pen versus Chirac. And that was the first time that people sat up and thought, my God, the National Front or the Rassemblement National as they are now are a political force. And we have seen over the space of 20 years the populist right growing more popular. I mean, Matteo, I wonder, you know, we've, we've got Giorgio Maloney now in Italy. Is the populist right here to stay? First of all, thank you so much, because for me, that is a very good day. It's uh, the first day I joined to Tony Blair Institute, uh, and uh, I became colleague of uh, Sana and uh, other, a lot of people, so I'm so excited. I think I am here as expert of chaos, because I'm expert of Italian politics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can imagine, uh, really, populism of far right is present everywhere. Is not only in Italy or in France, is everywhere thinking what happened also in your country and particularly what could happen in the next months in the United States again. Uh, my opinion is that first, we have a problem with the spending power. The working class is in crisis and the middle class is out of the game in the day-by-day -day life. That is the first problem who create a good climate, a good environment for populism of far right. Second point, I think uh, Tony explains very well in the article uh, Sunday in the Sunday Times and also this morning. If we don't accept the challenge of uh, fight against criminality, in 1997 New Labour won with uh, a message very clear uh, order and law. But if we, from left, we don't accept the idea to fight against the criminality and the sentiment of fear of the poor people, of the middle class, in terms of have a strategy against uh, criminality, I think we don't win and we open the doors to the uh, far-right uh, populism. The third and the last, I think we have a cultural problem around the world. And that is a cultural problem always in the universities in USA. This is a problem we have in the debate also in our uh, discussion academic world because without the discover again the, sentiment, the, the sense of the meaning of the word culture and identity, who is not against the future, is the route to accept the challenge of the future, we continue to lose a part of population. So I think the populism of far right is a danger, of course. 
is a presence very strong uh, inside the countries. You won in UK also because a part of far right voted against conservative. That is very good for the victory of Labour Party, in my humble opinion. We in Italy we lost because uh, the fight was supported from the division of the left. So it depends from the single institutional uh, in, in, um, instruments. But the real point is if you accept to have an idea of the future as an idea of hope, hope and optimism. That is the point. And that is the point for the which I'm so happy to be part of Tony Blair Institute because it's the only place around the world in which the future is not only a source of preoccupation and fear. The future is the most important challenge and the most important ally we have if we believe to be progressists. If we are progressists, we believe in the progress and we believe in the future. That is the problem of far right understand and left don't, doesn't understand now. That is the problem. Sano, is it the same issues in Finland that are kind of the drivers of populism or are there different issues that are, are taking place there? Well, I, I do agree with Matteo that we are seeing the rise of far right or extreme right everywhere in Europe and actually everywhere in democratic world. Um, but it's not a new phenomenon. If we look at Europe's history for the past 100 years, there have been always populistic movements, there have been extreme right parties, movements even much, much worse than what we are witnessing right now. So it's not a new phenomenon. And it actually grows from the same roots, fear of people, fear of change, um, resentment uh, of government, resentment of power or the so-called elite. Uh, people feel frustrated when their everyday lives are not seen or heard, when they see that there is injustice in the societies. And populistic movements, far-right parties, they are, feed, they are taking these feelings of fear and resentment and using those feelings for their own benefit to gain popularity and support in uh, elections in democratic countries. I'm very happy, of course, of the massive win of Labour Party here in UK. It is a victory for sense. It is a victory for reason. I'm also very relieved of the French elections that were just in this, this couple of days. Um, it was a relief, and, but it will also mean, I think, difficult negotiations to form a government, but still the far right didn't win. And now we're all looking of course, to the US elections, what will happen there. And, and let's face it, uh, it could all go terribly wrong and the whole world will feel the pain of the possible uh, win of Donald Trump. So it will uh, pose a threat, I think, to all of Europe. Uh, and we should really also look at our own backyard and try to figure it out how will we face this new kind of uh, populistic uh, movements and the upcoming of possible uh, second presidency of, of Donald Trump. Yeah, so, I mean, let me ask, because you raise a really interesting point about the, the sense that <clears throat> the elites are out of touch and the, the people are being left behind and they've got no sense of power. Do you think conventional politics, you three, conventional politicians, are, are sort of partly responsible for not recognising people's concerns over standard of living, over, you know, inflation over immigration, the issues that have been seem to have been the drivers of this populist movement. I mean, I'll ask each of you if you go. Sam. Well, if I will start, we had an election in Finland just over a year ago. Uh, the Social Democrats, we were in power before we, I held the prime minister's seat. We also won the elections. We gained uh, support. We gained more seats, but not enough. The opposition won. They just by margins. In Finland, we are talking about 0.7% of difference in, in uh, winning elections. So not like massive differences like, like here in the UK. So the Conservative Party, they were the first one to enter uh, the finishing line. And then uh, the populistic or you would say far right party, the true Finns, and they formed a government. Uh, we were the third, but still we gained support. Um, and when we look at the last 
period of, of election period, uh, what we did, we managed COVID, I think, well, even though it was hard for everybody, I think we managed okay. Um, the war in Ukraine, enter NATO, we met all of those crises that everybody else here in Europe also met. Uh, and at the same time, we were able to actually fulfill 98% of our governmental program. The lowest uh, unemployment rate, uh, we had problems with our economy, but still many of those meters were going to the right direction. And people weren't actually, I don't think that they were so frustrated of the government because we gained popularity of over 60% up all till the end. Uh, but one of our coalition partners said before the elections that they won't, wouldn't partner with us anymore, so we couldn't form a majority coalition. And in Finland, we always have coalition governments, so you need many parties within a government to form majority government. But we fulfilled 98% of our governmental program, and we did a bunch of big, big reforms, which I'm very proud of. So I wouldn't say that it was like reaction towards um, not being uh, satisfied with the work that the previous government did, but we did loss within the margins of, I think, 0.9% um, um, yeah, um, or something. Yeah, and Matteo, you said, you, you know, the problem in Italy was that the left was split and that's how Giorgia Maloney uh, ends up being prime minister. But she did tap into that discontent that was felt among certain sections of the population that they had been left behind. It's very complicated to discuss about populism in Italy because if you consider populism as a, a startup, Italy is a Silicon Valley because uh, <laughs> we, 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 we saw in the last 30 years uh, the first Berlusconi, Five Star Movement, uh, Lega Nord, uh, uh, an unbelievable number of different populists and populisms. I think three very brief points. First, we live, particularly in Italy, at the problem of populism also because uh, as uh, uh, politicians we need a timeline, a vision, an horizon, and we are in the middle of a day-by-day -day election with the election on Twitter, Instagram. There is not vote, there is like. And the politicians think about day-by-day, -day about the, the the, f the last point is, I, I have a tweet uh, two hours ago and I have uh, less like than the past. That is a problem. We destroy the credibility of a project and a vision. Second point, we have a problem in Italy, particularly with the question of migration. Please, nobody believe the truth. The truth in Italy, we have the immigration problem, not migration in terms of numbers, if you consider very, not artificial intelligence, natural intelligence, and you look at the numbers, you know the problem is the young guys, the young girls who left Italy, study in Italy, and then they, uh, are, they come to London, they come to USA and the rest of the world, and that problem is impossible to cl clarify without a different of narrative, and uh, that is, a, we cannot uh, uh, continue in this point, but it's a second point. The third for me is Europe. I'm a great fan of Europe, I love Europe, I dream United States of Europe, but when I listen, Tony told about 16,000 uh, uh, engineering who have to stay in uh, um, Singapore, city-state, I think probably we have to fire 60,000 people <laughs> in Brussels, uh, bureaucrats uh, in Brussels, and hires. Okay, so, sorry, you remember parliament. <laughs> but 60,000, because it's unbelievable the red tape of bureaucracy we have today in Europe. Europe was a dream. Europe was the most great achievement of the history of the 20th century, in my opinion. Now Europe risked to become a museum, a green museum, and not a lab. And I particularly after this morning, with the great approach of future, I think we have a problem for populism because Europe is a place of the past and not the future. That is a, one of our problems. Do you agree with that? Do you understand that my poor life for Fordy and Alf in the cabinet with this prime minister as Europe minister? <laughs> 
I mean, so the best uh, job around the world, please. I, I hope you're sympathetic with me. I'm, I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> Go on. I think that uh, from the pers from the from the you we know, are asking about Italy, Finland, and France perspective. Uh, from the France perspective, there are two, three main problems. The first that uh, France uh, thinks uh, still of itself as a big power, a major power. So uh, on certain key issues, the French voters, the French citizens are much more demanding than in, in other countries. Secondly, there is uh, certainly a strong problem with identity politics. So, I mean, the debate on binational, the debate on the relation between the Republic and the Islam, etc. And third, there is a lot of insecurity and anxiety. And to me, the answer is both at national level and European level, because it's a question of empowerment and it's a question of power. Just on identity I mean, politics, do, yeah. you think, do you think that liberal politics, centrist politics, I don't know, progressive politics, maybe that's the better word for it, has gone on gone along with identity politics too readily and lost sight of bigger issues in the process? I think that we have neglected the, ne neglected the real anxiety. And I think that we can uh, start to be heard again by the citizens only if we do, do not dismiss their anxiety. That can, might be, may, they might not be grounded on scientific basis, but they are there. And to answer to this anxiety, you have to empower people. All over this morning, we have talked about future. We talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about green, uh, green change. We cannot impose this on the ordinary citizens. We must empower them. We must um, them, uh, put them in the condition to take fully on, on board this, uh, this change. So artificial intelligence, for me, is the biggest opportunity of our era. For most of the citizens, it's something scary because they cannot handle it, because they don't know it. So it is clear that you, we have to work a lot on vocational training, on education. We cannot le leave behind people around artificial intelligence. There is a huge generational gap. I mean, we have to push for artificial intelligence, but we cannot say to those who are 60, 70 years old, well, I mean, you're, you're out. You cannot talk to your public administration anymore. You cannot book a, a, a train ticket anymore because you don't know how to handle. So this is something important. This is something that we have neglected. So, and the Green Deal is the same. I mean, why uh, the uh, populists were so successful in fighting against the Green Deal? But first of all, for some mistake that our dear friend Franz Timmermans made, okay. But secondly, because we never, and we've never been clear who is going to pay. Who is going to pay? So, so I mean, Here's the challenge then. How, voting for the far right, I mean, four million people voted for reform in the UK last Thursday. And it has become normalized that you can do this and it doesn't seem shocking. How do you turn the tide? How do you reinforce the center? How do you make the argument for progressive politics in an era where we've got the internet, where we've got social media, where we've got Russia trying to stir the pot because they want to see Europe fail as a project. Oh. Sana. Well, if we look at Europe for democratic countries, I think the obvious thing is, is that we are actually lacking leadership. If we look at the world today, we have major issues. We have major problems. Climate change, changing digital environment, new technologies, emerging politicians, and the system don't know how to handle this. Uh, we have wars uh, in the world. Authoritarian countries are rising their heads and really challenging uh, the rule-based order, democratic countries, and we are lacking leadership. Where are the brave leaders that will take the initiative, that will have the courage to say what they think, that will have the courage Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to your point. Matteo, you pick it up because a hand mic is coming out. Matteo, you just pick that point up. Oh, no, we've got a hand mic. There we are. We went first. It matches me Russia, I think. They, they shut my mic up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as I was saying, we're facing era of big, big challenges of the world. And the world needs leadership, democratic leadership, liberal leadership, leadership with vision. 
Uh, and I think people would like to vote for that leadership. They would like to vote for that courage. They would like to vote for that vision. But for some reason, maybe because of the reason that Matteo said before, politicians, they're looking on their social media, they're looking likes, they are looking day-to-day -day basic things and not actually taking their focus on the real matters at hand. And I think that the people, they are, they are just thirsty for real vision and a real uh, strategic analysis of the world and a plan how to fix these major challenging things that we are all facing. And when we look at Europe, I think European Union, it's in trouble uh, because of the reason that you mentioned, but there has also been a big things that we have been managed to do. For example, in COVID, it was a big success when we did have the common purchases of the vaccination, when we did able, when we were able uh, to, to distribute those vaccinations to our citizens, we were able to solve these problems. And I want to believe that we are also able to solve another problems, but we have to work together. And I think what we also need is a vision for Europe, not for a vision of individual countries, but actually for the whole Europe. How can we work together to solve these challenges that we are, way, uh, yeah, that we are facing? For example, the situation in Ukraine. How can we help Ukraine to prevail the war when they are now facing uh, this disaster defending the whole Europe? It is so ghastly that um, the president of Hungary, uh, the, the prime minister of Hungary is visiting Moscow and, and meeting Putin at the same time when Russia is bombing children's hospital. Yeah. Not in the name of Europe. But we need voices to really tackle these problems that we have in Europe, within Europe. And it's an abom abomination that uh, Orban is even the one that could help the presidency uh, of European Union. I think we should ha just have Hungary to let loose uh, on this task and put the next one uh, at hand to, to uh, lead the presidency in European Council. Okay. It is an abom abomination. Agreed. Matteo. I think that uh, in my little experience, I became prime minister at 39 years old. When I was 39 years old, uh, the youngest prime minister, the youngest is not important in Italy because the second was Mussolini, so the benchmark is not so good. <laughs> but when I became prime minister, I remember I tried to give a message of a great uh, optimism about the future. And with this approach, we delivered a lot of reforms, maybe too much. We did a great job, but we lost the confidence, particularly of my generation. Because we gave, the mess we gave a message maybe too superficial about how future could be good, particularly when the people have some difficulties. So my question about the future is that we have to combine together a great vision as the great ap approach we can do in the next uh, 10 years, but at the same time to don't forget never the difficulties of the people, particularly of the new generation, because uh, we have an expectation of life. This morning you explained very well, unbelievable, in UK from 68 to 81 years old, and we have a new generation, we risk to lose the new generation in the isolation and the solitude. So my opinion is we have to give a message of great hope for the future, but at the same time, this great vision has to be a day-by-day -day plan, a day-by-day -day execution, a day-by-day -day capacity to combine together everyone. A very brief word, because we're out of time. Listen, we live uh, in a world where brutal violence is back, where barbarism has become a weapon of war, Look at the uh, Children Hospital in Ukraine, and we have to provide ourselves with the real power at European level. Military power, digital power, industrial power. The, the, the only answer that we can, we can give, and the only level at which we can provide ourselves with the new uh, politics of power and security is Europe. And by the way, this is an excellent ground of cooperation between Keir Starmer, Emmanuel Macron, and the other EU leaders in the next years. And we have still three years 
to let these two leaders work together. All of you, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Great panel, thank you.